So I graduated from the University of Kentucky last year where I was on the swim team. Um, I was able to accomplish some really amazing things in my career that I'm extremely proud of and will, will forever be proud of. But my senior year last year, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Leah Thomas story. Um, Leah Thomas is a six foot four, fully intact biological male um, who swam three years on the men's side at University of Pennsylvania before switching to the women's team um, during his senior year. And so last year, out of nowhere, this person who at the time I had no idea was a biological male began posting the fastest times in the nation across multiple events. Um, it was very bizarre. There were several red flags, one of which this was someone I had never heard of, um, which, is un which is rare in swimming, especially when you're competing at that top tier. And so an article was posted disclosing that Leah Thomas was formerly Will Thomas. And about three weeks before our NCAA championships, the NCAA announced that Leah would be competing with us. So that first day of the meet, I got to personally feel the effect that this infringement had on myself and my teammates. We sat on the side of the pool and watched Leah Thomas swim to a national title in the 500 freestyle, beating out three Olympians, American record holders, the most impressive female swimmers of all time by body lengths. And I want to add that this was a male swimmer who the year before was ranked at best 462nd in the men's division. And so that next day, Leah Thomas and I competed against each other in the 200 yard freestyle, which ultimately ended in a tie. Um, which now, <laughs> now looking back, I realize kind of how God has moved through all of this. But we tied, we went the exact same time down to the hundredth of a second. And so upon tying, we go behind the awards podium where the NCAA officials hand you your trophy and you're marched out and you're named an All-American. Um, but we go back there and the official looks at me and Leah, we're about this far apart, and he says, great job, you guys tied, uh, Leah gets the trophy. And so I look at him and I say, okay, I understand we tied and I understand there's one trophy, but what's your, what's your thought process as to why Leah gets the trophy? And he said, well, for photo purposes, Leah has to have the trophy, so you can pose with this one, but you go home empty handed, Leah takes the trophy. And so, that's truly, of course I knew what was happening was wrong in regards to our unfair, dis, or the disadvantage that we were at, and I knew what was happening in regards to the locker room being forced to undress in front of a fully intact biological male. I knew that was wrong. But when the NCAA reduced everything that I had dedicated my entire life to, I've been swimming since I was four years old, everything that I have dedicated my entire life to, I was reduced to a photo op to validate the identity of a male. And that's when I decided to take a public stance and really just standing in the truth. Uh, they say that you two are committing genocide by opposing their movement. What do, what do you have to say to that, Riley? It seems as if we've gotten to a point in society where, well, it doesn't seem as if we have gotten to a point in society where we're denying basic truths. Man and woman is the sheer essence of humanity, and these people are trying to blur that line so we can't define what it is to be a woman. We have a sitting Supreme Court justice who refuses to say what a woman is. This is a problem, and this is something that translates far beyond my expertise of sports and far beyond Chloe's expertise. Look at what's happening in prisons. Look at what's happening, of course, within the education system. There's so many realms of life where they're trying to this, they have, they're pursuing this aggressive attempt to fully eradicate women a as a whole, which is incredibly heartbreaking, um, especially being 22, sitting back here seeing this. I don't know if I was just naive before or if this is something that has been totally sprung upon us, but it's an attack, and it's, it's, it's an attack on women. Um, it's the women who are at jeopardy here. Yeah. What do you have to say to the politicians that say that this is just a trumped up culture war and we, shouldn't be, we should be focusing on the fiscal issues and the important issues of the day? Well, I've been going around to a lot of different states and testifying on behalf of women in sports or fairness in women's sports legislation. And that is something I'm seeing is when I go to these states like Kansas or Oklahoma or Colorado, which failed miserably, unfortunately, um, 
these, these Democrats, they say, oh, well, this isn't happening. We have four transgender athletes in the state. Why are we worried about this? We have other more pressing issues. First, that is not true. These states that say they have four transgender athletes, it is so incredibly underreported. You might have four transgender athletes on one softball team. I talked to a person on, on the plane the other day on my way home from Texas who said her daughter's team had seven transgenders on her basketball team. Seven, and this is in Texas. So it's happening. Um, there's cases of happening all across college that are not reported on because these universities don't want to admit they have men on their women's teams, but they do. Um, it's happening, I had a parent reach out to me, her daughter's six-year-old cheerleading team. And it's not a co-ed, it, it's a women's, or I guess young girls cheerleading team had a male flipping up and down the court. Um, it's happening in master's divisions. I talked to a 65-year-old lady golfer who's competing against a man. And so to believe that it's a non-issue is so far from the truth. Um, if nothing else, let's say Leah Thomas didn't solely transition to win, to change in the locker room with women. This opens a door to people who would fully be willing to take advantage of that opportunity. And that's what we're seeing, especially in regards to prisons, where we see these men who are convicted of terrible, awful crimes like rape and kidnapping and, and just heinous things. They're now identifying as women because it means they can get into women's prisons. Um, it's more lenient, the charges are less. Um, they're seeing this happen, and so just in California a few weeks ago, after seeing this be successful for a few, over 200 males applied to be in women's prisons. Like, come on, we're taking advantage of the system, the system that's already failing, and it's, again, only harming women. Yeah. So I just wanna open it to both of you. We'll start with you, Riley. What are your closing words for America, right? Because this isn't just the conservative movement. This is America that you're talking to. The news is going to cover it. What do you have to say to everyone? What do you want people to take away from this? My takeaway from what's really happened, I truthfully feel like since COVID, I feel like COVID expedited things. The pendulum has swung so far. I mean, we're, like I said, we're denying basic truths. This is like a George Orwell dystopian novel that we're actually living in. Um, and so my message to Americans, my message to parents, my message to young female athletes, it's so important to use your voice. It's so important to not feel like you just have to cave to the woke fads of today. Um, because speaking from my experience and talking to these athletes who are terrified into speaking out, I'm talking, uh, we don't have time, obviously, but this is not just a fairness in women's sports issue, this is a freedom of speech issue. These girls have their voices suppressed like no other, but it's crucial we recognize what silence is, because silence is complicity. And when we're complicit, the left, in particular, is going to keep getting away with these things that the majority of the country is not okay with. Um, so my message to Americans is to use your voice Stand firm in what you believe and stand firm in the truth.